السلام علیکم ان دس کورس وی اسٹارٹڈ اور ڈسکشنز وتھ سمپل سسٹمز اور ان وٹ ڈو آئی مین بائی سمپل سسٹمز we looked at a single qubit which is a two level quantum system we looked at single electrons the wave function of an electron we looked at single photons single atoms a single infinite well a single finite well a single alpha particle trying to come out of the nucleus and causing radioactivity So even though in our daily life we don't deal with single particles, we, we, we look at collections of large numbers of particles. But we started our discussion in, it, in this course by looking at single systems. And the advantage of looking at single systems is that the quantum mechanics that is the language to describe these systems applies perfectly well. Quantum mechanics is easily applicable to single systems, even though we don't deal with single systems in our daily lives. If you would like to describe quantum mechanics, we would have to use the toy of single systems, single electrons, single particles, single photons. So those are our toy models, which are easy to grasp with the machinery of quantum mechanics. But our real life is not that easy. Our real life is actually dealing with large number of particles, with ensembles of particles. With, so a single 18 grams of water, for example, would contain an Avogadro number of water molecules, which is 10 raised to the power 23 molecules. One mole of water, 18 grams would contain 10 is about 23 molecules. So really, in our daily life, we deal with large quantities of substances because we're living in a macroscopic world. And when we deal with large systems, large numbers of particles, ensembles of particles, the physics changes altogether. And we get a new branch of physics that is called statistical mechanics. So statistical mechanics deals with large systems and the, de and the dealings with large systems are somewhat different from the dealings with single systems. So we have to resort to a new machinery, to a new language and the physics also changes. In physics, there was a famous, uh, there was a Nobel laureate with the name Anderson and he gave an important statement which has become a golden rule to describing large ensembles of particles and he once said more is different so if you have two particles those two particles are not going to be the sum of single particle behaviors. If you have three particles, those three particles are not going to behave like the sum of three particles. You have more particles in the system, the system behaves totally differently. The network, the aggregate, the congregation, the assembly of particles gives rise to new physics. That's it. That is what it means by more is different. And we've already looked at systems which involve large numbers of particles, for example, what kind of systems have we seen in this course which involve large numbers of particles? Can you give me an example? Yes? Lasers. Lasers. Lasers themselves deal with large number of photons coming out of the laser cavity. So it's not a single photon that is coming out of the cavity, it's a large number of photons. And all of the photons, they are condensing into a giant macroscopic quantum state. Any other example? Bose-Einstein condensates.
In a Bose-Einstein quantum state, we have an assembly of atoms, a molasses, a soup of large number of atoms, and all of them are pooled together with the help of laser pooling, and all of them then share a giant macroscopic quantum state. The gas becomes a quantum gas. The overlapping wave functions give rise to a superposition wave function that is not the same as the sum of the individual wave functions. It's a large macroscopic wave function. So everything is condensed in the quantum reality. It's not like a transition from liquid to a solid. It's a phase transition in the quantum reality. That's what a Bose-Einstein condensate. So these are the two examples that we've seen for large systems. Today we're going to look at another kind of system which is also large because it's a collection of large number of particles and that is what is generally called a solid. Now in between single systems, atoms, electrons and solids is something in between and that is a molecule. So we are moving from elementary particles like electrons to atoms. We've seen the quantization of levels inside atoms. In particular, we focus on the hydrogen atom. And atoms then combine together to form the next to the next uh, pedestal in the chain of structure, which is a molecule. And the next higher stage of the evolution of structure is a solid. So solids behave differently than a large number of single atoms. This is an implication of more is different. Now, in order to understand solids, solids like this piece of chalk, this wood, wooden table, we would have to come up with some new physics. Physics that derives from the basic physics that we've seen so far, but is totally different in its character and outcome. And I will take the route of molecules, describing molecules. Suppose I could make a lithium molecule, a fictitious molecule which has two lithium atoms joined together. Okay? So this is like a dimer. Two lithium atoms joined together in the form of a lithium molecule, a standalone lithium molecule, not a solid. Okay? So this is a fictitious molecule here. Now in this lithium, in a single atom, we know that we have a 1s orbital and the next highest level is 2s. Okay? And there are quantum numbers associated with electrons that go into these levels. And there are three electrons that have to fill into these two levels. The first two electrons would go into 1s, and they will keep their spins opposite because of the Pauli exclusion principle. And the third electron has no choice but to go into the next higher level, 2s, and keep its spin whatever it likes, likes it to have. So this is a native, pristine, standalone lithium atom. And there's another lithium atom far away in, in the universe. And the two lithium atoms, they are identical, but they're distinguishable because the lithium, lithium atoms are far away. Okay, you can selectively, this lithium atom has an address in the universe. This lithium atom has an address in the universe, and these addresses are distinct. So these are identical lithium atoms, but distinguishable. Now you bring these lithium atoms close together and the wave functions for these electrons, each one of these electrons in a particular orbital will have a wave function. You know what the 1s wave function looks like? It's a spherically symmetric wave function. This is 2s. This is also spherically symmetric with a higher number of nodes. So each one of these electrons has a wave function. Now you bring the wave functions close together, they start to overlap. Those wave functions start to share the same region of space. And they start, these atoms would like to now conjoin and form some kind of a bond or a molecular orbital as it is called. Now these levels, 
they have certain energies. This is an energy E1. This is an energy E2. Now I bring the atoms close together. And when I start bringing the atoms close together, their energies start to be different. Now I have new wave functions that are constructed, which are superpositions of these wave functions. So if this electron has a wave function psi 1s, this electron has a wave function psi 1s. Now when these wave functions come closer together, I can form new superpositions. I can form a wave function psi 1s. First electron, let's call it x1 plus psi 1s x2. This is one wave function that I can construct. I can construct another wave function with a minus sign in between. So I can construct new kinds of wave functions. The precise mathematics is not important. But the upshot is, the smaller of the lesson is that these energy levels will start to split. All right, so let me redraw the diagram. I am bringing two energy structures close together. So this is the distance between atoms. This is an energy scale. I have a 1s level at a particular energy, which I denoted as E1. And I have another level. This is the 1s level, the 2s level. And this energy I have denoted as E2. Now when I decrease the distance between levels, which means that these levels are moving towards the left. They are moving, the distance is decreasing between the atoms. What's going to happen to these levels is that they are going to split up. Because this atom is now seen in a neighboring atom. The wave functions superpose, giving rise to new wave functions with new energies. And this wave function is now going to see another wave function from a neighboring atom, and as a result, this wave function of each atom is going to split up. This wave function is also going to split up, and the energy is also going to be split up. Just consider the hydrogen molecule. This is something you should be familiar with. I have a 1s orbital and another 1s orbital. This orbital belongs to atom A, this orbital belongs to atom B. As a molecule is being formed, the two hydrogen atoms are coming closer together, two new molecular orbitals are formed. One of them has lower energy than the original, and the other one has higher energy than the original. So this is 1s belonging to atom 1, this is 1s belonging to atom 2. This orbital is psi 1s belonging to atom 1 minus psi 1s belonging to atom 2. This new orbital that is formed with a higher energy is psi 1s belonging to atom 1 plus psi 1s belonging to atom 2. And these two new orbitals that are formed, they are called molecular orbitals. And you study this in chemistry as well. So now these two identical atoms which are far apart and hence distinguishable when they are brought in close proximity to one another this level is split up, it spans into two. Out of two starting orbitals, one in each, we get two new molecular orbitals with energies that are different from the starting orbitals. Right? This is generally called the bonding molecular orbital and this is generally called the anti-bonding molecular orbital. Okay? Chemists would like to call this the sigma orbit. And they would like to call this the sigma star orbit. Bonding and anti-bonding molecule with distinct energies. So these energies are split up. Okay? And if this hydrogen atom orbit has a single electron, 
single electron here, the two electrons would like to lower their energy. So they would like to go, both of them would like to go into this bonding molecular orbital. But quantum mechanics dictates that it's going to have opposite spins. Okay? So a sigma bond is formed between the hydrogen atoms. That's what exists in a dihydrogen molecule. Now consider this lead example of lithium. We have one S and two S orbitals. Now as these orbitals come together in two neighboring atoms inside the lithium dimer, these orbitals are going to split up. This orbital is going to split up. So if originally there were two atoms had six electrons. Correct? So you have to put in six electrons into this new manifold. So two electrons go here. You start from the lower energies. Two electrons would go here. You have four electrons. And the remainder two electrons would go here. So you have four kind of orbitals that are made, molecular orbitals. And this is how the electrons are populated. This orbital over here is empty. Now this is what happens when two atoms are brought closer together to form a dimer or a molecule. But in a solid, we have millions and billions and trillions and zillions of atoms that are close together in close proximity of one another. One atom is neighboring, say, is coordinated by, say, six other atoms in a cubic lattice. Each neighbor is then coordinated by six neighboring atoms. So there is a large coordination inside a solid. Every atom, in a sense, is being affected by every other atom inside the solid because of this what, this network of this atomic network. So now you have a large number, a humongous number of atoms interacting with one another. Excuse me, you're constantly disturbing me. Now, because of this large number of atoms, the scenario that we observe is that each 1s orbital, instead of splitting into two orbitals, will split up into n orbitals, into n levels, if there are n atoms involved. So now if I consider, instead of the lithium dimer, if I consider lithium solid, the metal itself, and I will draw an energy level diagram. I have now many atoms, large number of atoms. I can't even count them. Depends upon the size of the solid and the density of the solid. So each 1s orbital belonging to each atom is now spread out. It fans out into a collection of finely spaced energy levels. So now I can, each level is split up into n levels. Suppose I have n atoms inside the metal. In a dimer, I had two atoms. So each level would split up into two levels. And this splitting would happen for all the, for all the atoms. In in the solid, this level is now going to split up into n finely spaced levels. And since n is large, the spacing of these levels is so fine that it's actually imperceptible. You can't see it. It's so small. If you have a microscope, a quantum a uh, quantum magnifying lens, you could be able to see the spacing between two levels and it's minute, it's minuscule, it's hardly observable. Say 10 raised to the power minus 22 electron volts. Extremely small, whereas the energies are large. You've already seen for a Fermi gas that the energies are automatically large because of the Pauli exclusion principle. So the energies are of the scale of electron volts, but the spacing is only 10 to the minus 22 electron volts, so the spacing is hardly observable. 
So this collection of energy levels is called a band. An energy band. And since this collection of levels is giving is given birth to by a 1s orbital, this is for lithium, this is maybe called the 1s band of electrons. Likewise, this 2s atomic level, when we consider N, capital N, this is also going to fan out, spread out into a, into a band. Into another band. Finally, space levels. There are so many of them that I can't even possibly draw them in my own. In all of my life, I can't draw them because there's so many of them. So this 2s atomic level, fine atomic level, is spread up into a series, a band of finely spaced atomic levels. The spacing is hardly observable. This is the 2s band in lithium. Now you have two kinds of bands. Okay? And if we're talking about lithium, is this band completely filled? It is completely filled because you started off with the 1s orbital in each atom being completely filled. There are two electrons in, in an orbital and that's the maximum this single level can hold. Right? Now, this single atomic level holds two electrons. Now all of these lithium atoms are coming together at the 1s atomic orbital. Each one of them is completely filled. So when you make a collection of the levels or a band, each one of these levels is completely filled, which means that the band is completely filled. This band is completely filled. Now what about this band? It's half filled. Right? Because the 2s atomic level was half filled to start off with. Now this is typical of a metal. I could draw a, the energy level structure of a metal or a conductor as it is called in the following fashion. This is my energy scale and I may have bands Suppose I draw two bands. One of these bands is completely filled. So this band corresponds to electrons that are within the core of, of the atom. So these two, these 1s electrons are in the inner shell of lithium. This 2s is the outer shell of lithium. So these are core electrons. So these, this band is a core band. These electrons inside this band, they are core electrons. But then on top of it, you have another band. Okay? Now this band is called the conduction band in general. In the conduction band is partly filled. So I would not fill this band completely. I would just fill it up to its half, up to half. So this conduction band is partly filled. This is typical of a metal. And there's a gap between this core band it can also be called the valence band, VB. This can be called the conduction band. And there's a gap. There's an energy gap between the valence and the conduction band. And the conduction band is partly filled. 
Excuse me, you don't have to be in the class. This production band has to be partly filled. Part, partial filling of the production band means there are vacant energy levels available inside the band. So some portion of this band is empty, which means that I shaded this band. Actually, there are electrons in this band. I shaded them because there are electrons here. And these electrons are mobile. The electrons in the production band are mobile. If I apply an electric field, you know that these electrons are charged particles. So applying an electric field would apply a force on these particles, which is given by minus E, E. This is the electric field. Now when you apply a force on an electron, it's going to accelerate, A. It's going to be some acceleration, minus E over M, where M is the mass of the electron. And when there is acceleration, there is going to be an increase in the speed of the electron. There is going to be a new speed, Vf. Final speed is the initial speed, plus A P. Now this A is minus E M E T. So the speed is going up because of the electric field. As time progresses, the speed goes up. Now, if the speed goes up, the energy goes up. So if I were to apply an electric field in this scenario, this electron, since it has empty energy levels inside the band, this electron can be promoted to higher energy levels. All of these electrons can go up the energy box scale. They can increase their energy, they can increase their speed and contribute to conduction. That's why inside a conductor, if you look at a band picture of a conductor, a metal is an example of a band of a conductor, there is always there are always empty states in the conduction band nearby. This is the Fermi level, the highest occupied level, and Beyond the Fermi level, in close proximity, there are empty energy levels. In other words, you have a partially filled conduction band. And this is typical of a metal. This is the picture of a metal. And there's a gap here. Whenever you have energy bands, gaps appear. This is why more is different. You don't have it looks quite strange. This is not explicable by classical mechanics. You have a nice continuous fine gradation of energy levels, all of them together, and suddenly there appears a gap. A finite width. E.g. Gap is a gap. And then you have another band. Now, how are conductors different from insulators? A metal is an example of a conductor, right? Okay. Now let's look at an insulator. Let's draw the energy band diagram of an insulator. Let me for simplicity use the same picture. This is my conduction band, this is my valence band, and this is a gap here. Now the valence band is completely filled. And the conduction band is completely empty. Okay? And there's a large gap. This gap could be, in typical insulators, for example in diamond, it could be of the order of 4 electron volts, roughly. So this is an insulator and a gap. Now it's possible that you can, now there are no conduction, no mobile electrons available. Now it's possible that you can make an insulator into a conductor. How can you do that? You apply a strong enough electric field, a really strong electric field, so that electrons from the valence band can jump over, they can be accelerated to such large energy that they can jump over the gap. This is when the insulator breaks down as an insulator. 
This is when lightning occurs. Air, which is normally an insulator, can break down its dielectric properties. It can break down as an insulator, and it can conduct electricity. It becomes that because the voltages across clouds is so large that the air can break down as an insulator. So every insulator has to break down strength. If you apply an electric field large enough, conduction can ensue, which means that this gap can somehow be overcome by an electric field. But normally, in laboratory scale conditions, in everyday life conditions, you don't see this breakdown because this conduction band is totally empty. Even if you were to apply an electric field, there are no mobile electrons inside this conduction band. And these electrons can't go anywhere because this compartment of the energy band structure is jam-packed. It's already packed. There's nowhere for the electrons to go. There are no vacant levels nearby. Okay? Yes. Cross this gap, then the insulator breaks down. It starts conducting. Yes? Okay, we'll talk about that. There was a question over there. Aap ka swal tha? Uh, not precisely, it makes sense in molecules, but these energy levels, some of them have lower energies, some of them have, have higher energy, higher energy. So it makes sense in that in that sense. Yes. Right. So the purpose of them that if you assume that your voltage is not going to exceed a certain level, a capacitor, you want to have capacitors. Capacitors have a have some insulator between the plates. And you know that the capacitors don't operate beyond a certain voltage. Every capacitor has a maximum rated voltage. So you would like the capacitor to behave like a capacitor, which means you would like to have an insulator between the plates. But the capacitor has a maximum rated voltage. Every device that we use, every insulator that we use, actually has a rating. The maximum voltage under which it will behave as an insulator. Okay? So now, this these are the two major classes of solids as far as conduction is concerned. Okay? But then we have this question that is asked, which is actually the workhorse of modern electronics and modern telecommunication. There's the semiconductor. In a semiconductor, what you observe is a behavior that is somewhat similar to an insulator. So this is a conductor. An insulator, totally filled valence band, and totally empty conduction band, and in between you have an insulator. <laughs> so this is the energy band structure of a semiconductor. at zero Kelvin. First of all, let's look at zero Kelvin, the ultimate frigid temperature that you can think of. The valence band is completely filled. And I'm talking about a pure semiconductor, an undoped semiconductor, silicon or germanium. Pure silicon, pure germanium. <laughs> And remember that silicon is the purest element known to mankind. Because you like to make pure silicon. It's made in our fabrication laboratories. The semiconductor industry depends upon ultra pure silicon. So you can get a one part per billion purity, which means if you have 10 to for 9 silicon atoms, there is only one defect. So you can ultra pure silicon, that's what we're talking about. Excuse me. Now there's a gap here, just like an insulator, and the conduction band is empty once again. But the gap is really small. For example, for silicon it's about one electron volt. 
or germanium, it could be 0.5 or 0.6 electron volt. So the gap, the size of the gap is smaller. So semiconductor, the difference between a semiconductor and an insulator is just out of our desire. It's just purely sub it's subjective in a sense. The gaps are smaller in a semiconductor. So there's only subjective difference. Okay? But the nice thing is that this gap is small, which means even a small electric field can make the electrons in the valence band jump over to the connection band and contribute to conduction. Not even, an, not just an electric field. This gap is so small that some temperature can actually cause electrons from the valence band. If this energy is of the order of this gap or larger or they are comparable, then thermal excitation can take place, which means that an electron from the valence band or the top of the valence band can actually jump across this otherwise insurmountable barrier and get into the conduction band and contribute to conduction. Okay, so the gap is small, so it's easier to initiate conduction in a semiconductor. Right? And the nice thing, and what is slightly different here, is that temperature is not large enough in an insulator to cross this gap, but it's larger. The temperature is still the same, but this gap is smaller, so it's easier to surmount this barrier. And when electrons jump into the conduction band and become mobile, they leave something in their way. They leave a footprint in the valence band. And what do they leave? Now, electrons are missing from the valence band. Everything is electrically neutral. So if this band, which is electrically neutral, right? Silicon is neutral. It's a neutral atom. So everything is neutral. This band is neutral. This band is neutral. Everything is neutral. So if from a band, electrons go missing, they leave in their way the emptiness of an electron. They are devoid of an electron. And such a, such a vacancy, such an empty, such a, the absence of an electron, a void, a negative void, acts like a positively charged particle. It acts like a positively charged particle, and I denote that by an empty hole. So as an electron is promoted, there is thermal generation of carriers. This process is called thermal generation of carriers. <clears throat> So when you have thermal generation of carriers, these electrons go into the conduction band, they contribute to conduction, and holes are created in the valence band. Okay? So thermal generation of carriers, carriers means something that can conduct electricity, that can contribute to the carriage of electricity. Thermal generation of carriers takes place because of the temperature, electrons inside the conduction band. So if I, but that's not just all the story. If I have, say, a semiconducting material, now I'm not drawing an energy band diagram, I'm drawing a crystal of a silicon. If I have a free electron here, So these yellow circles represent free electrons or electrons inside the conduction band. There are other electrons as well inside the core which are not free. We're not considering those because they don't contribute to conduction. So these yellow electrons, these yellow uh, circles are electrons in here. So when these electrons are created at temperatures above zero Kelvin, concomitant with the creation of these electrons, or along with the creation of these electrons, we have a simultaneous generation of holes as well. Because it's a pure silicon crystal, and this is what the silicon crystal looks like. I have a network of silicon atoms, 
which are arranged in a tetrahedral fashion, which I cannot draw possibly with accuracy on the blackboard, given my finite drawing skills. But I'm just drawing a plane of silicon atoms. The valence shell has four electrons. Each one of, each one of the silicon atom has four electrons. Covalent bonding exists between the silicon atoms. The electrons, each silicon atom has four electrons in the valence band. Three S two three P two. Now these electrons are inside the valence band, so I'm not drawing them as yellow circles, and they're not contributing to, to the flow of charge. So these are electrons inside the valence band. So this is the picture of the crystal at zero Kelvin. Now raise the temperature. This electron can actually come out of the bond and become free. And it can wander like a bag of bond inside the crystal. It's free. It has breakage. It has enough energy to overcome the bond energy. It breaks away from the bond. Now it becomes a free electron. And when it becomes a free electron, it leaves in its wake, in its footsteps, a hole. <laughs> All right. So electrons can become free. And you can get holes if the temperature is above 0 Kelvin. Now these are the electrons inside the conduction band and these are the holes inside the valence band. Now if I were to apply an electric field to this crystal, how do I apply an electric field? What's the easiest way of applying an electric field? By? How can I apply an electric field? Can you go home and apply an electric field to a crystal? How? Okay, you have to build metallic rods. The easiest way to do it. Connect a battery. So if you work to connect this to a battery, <coughs> rationally applying electric field, E. Under the action of this electric field, both holes are charged particles as well as electrons. Electrons are going to move in a certain direction. Electrons, these electrons in the conduction band are going to move in this direction against the direction of the electric field because these are negatively charged particles, whereas holes are going to move in parallel to the electric field. Now you have opposite charges moving in opposite direction. So both of these charge carriers are contributing to a current in the same direction. If I have a negative charge moving this way and I had a positive charge moving this way, then both of these channels of charges, both of these separate kinds of charge carriers are contributing to conduction in the same direction at the same time. If I had electrons moving this way and I had holes moving in the same way, same way would I have no net flux of charge. But in this case, I have electrons and holes moving in opposite directions, I do have a flux of charge. Okay? So both of them are contributing to conduction. So there is conduction due to holes, and conduction due to electrons. Electrons conduct in the conduction band and holes conduct in the valence band. And the question is, if I were to increase the temperature, what would happen to the conductivity or the resistivity or a semiconductor? Right at the back, right at the back. Can the either of you sitting at the back answer my question? If I were to increase the temperature of a semiconductor, should the current go up or down? Think about it. What's the general philosophy of this? What's going to happen in general? If I increase the temperature, what's going to happen to the charge, to the current?
बोले इनको इतनी बात ही गलत भी हो गया इतनी बात ही क्या हो गलत करें इनको जी इंक्रीज या डिक्रीज इंक्रीज बिल्कुल ठीक क्यों इंक्रीज होगा वाई वाल करेंट इंक्रीज The the resistivity goes down, the conductivity goes goes down, conductivity up. Why so? Anyone? <laughs> uh, more electrons to the conducting Because as the temperature goes up, thermal generation of carrier goes up. More electrons have enough energy to cross this gap. So more charged carriers. Electrons will be created inside the conduction band, and more holes will be created in the valence band. Since you have more charge carriers, more charge carriers, more current exists. And if you learn uh, in a course on electricity and magnetism, you learn that the current density, which is the current per unit area, is given by the number of charge carriers per unit volume. Times the amount of charge on each carrier times the velocity of the charge carrier, the drift velocity as it is called. Now, for semiconductors, you have a concentration of electrons of charge E, E B, and you have a concentration of holes. So both of them contribute to conduction, electrons as well as holes. And in a pure semiconductor, the concentration of electrons has to be the same as the concentration of holes because they are both created from nihilo. Both of them, they neither excess electrons, neither excess holes in a pure semiconductor. Whenever an electron is created in the connection band, a corresponding hole is created in the valence band. So this number is the same for a pure semiconductor. These two numbers are the same. The electron drift velocity can, however, be different from the hole drift velocity, but this is a technical detail. So, as the temperature goes up for a semiconductor, we expect its resistance in general. In general, there are other nuances, but in general, the resistance goes down. Let me show this. Let me show this effect to you. All right. So, we uh, can first connect this. अभी तक कोई सवाल जी वेल दिस इज अो इट सीन्स बट द मोबिलिटीज आर डिफरेंट बिकॉज द होल्स आर मूविंग इन दिस बैंड एंड इलेक्ट्रॉन्स आर मूविंग इन द प्रोडक्शन बैंड सो द प्रॉपर्टीज ऑफ दिस बैन आर डिफरेंट फ्रॉम द प्रॉपर्टीज ऑफ दिस बैंड ओके The curvature of this band is different from the curvature of this band, so the effective masses are different. So that's why they will respond to electric fields in a different way. But this is a more technical detail that I cannot possibly describe here. The upshot is that this band, in which the hole is moving, has different properties. The density of states is different. The curvature of the band is different than this band. That's why. There are different properties of the electron and the holes. The, the mobilities are different. Okay, let me move on uh, for the time being. So, a little later.
Achcha. He is not talking at the back. It disrupts the quality of the video as well, but it, more importantly, it disrupts me. So what I have here is a solid piece of a metal. And this solid piece of metal is hinged on a device, which is called a Peltier device. <coughs> Has anyone ever heard the name of, of, of the Peltier effect or a Peltier device? A Peltier device is a device that can create a temperature gradient. So I'm going to draw this device on the blackboard, but for the time being, here is a piece of solid. It rests on a Peltier device. I pass current through the Peltier device, and it changes the temperature of the of the surface of the device, which changes the temperature of this solid. And on the solid, I have placed a resistor, which is an example of an insulator or a metal. A resistor that we use in our board is actually a metal, it's carbon. It's a semi-metal, okay? So we have carbon, and, and the other device that I've attached to this solid piece, which is just a heat sink, is this device, which is not being attached currently. Let me show this device to you first. Can you see this bead here? This black bead? This is a piece of a semiconducting material. Okay? So I attach this piece to the Peltier device with the help of tape, thermal tape, and this other device is just a resistor. Okay? And then I have a circuit here. Can you just show the circuit or try to show the circuit? First open. So this circuit here, we could open see This circuit here is what we built in our lab. This is controlling the the Peltier. So it's controlling the direction of the current flow through the Peltier. So I can heat or cool the Peltier. So it has some transistors in here. This is a big heat sink because the transistors heat up. Large current flows through the Peltier. So this is the circuit that is controlling the current through the Peltier. All right, let me just show you what the Peltier looks like on the blackboard. The Peltier is actually, it has two plates. And inside the plates, there are rods of a certain material, which is generally a semiconducting material. And there are many rods of similar rods that are sandwiched between the plates. Now, if a current flows through this device in this direction, I, then the top surface heats up, it gets hot and this surface gets cold. If the current flows to the opposite direction to this device, this becomes the hot surface and this becomes the cold surface. Okay? So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to connect, I'm going to find the resistances of these materials. Okay? And for that purpose, I actually need to connect to this. So it's slightly complicated. You just have one camera and one screen.
All right. So what I've done is, the, let me show you what I'm trying to do here. semiconducting material, okay? So I have this, I connect the, the ohmmeter to the computer so that the voltage, the resistance of this device is actually appearing on the, on the screen here. controller, the temperature of this device, of this Peltier sur surface, is 5 degrees centigrade. So the temperature of the semiconducting material is roughly 5 degrees centigrade. Okay? And the resistance is about 3.9 kilo ohms. Now, of this small bead, of, of this material, of the semiconducting material, now I would like to increase the temperature. Currently it's at 5 degrees centigrade. If you touch this Peltier, it's going to be freezing cold, very cold. It's 5 degrees centigrade. Now what I would like to do, I would like to reverse the current to the Peltier so that the surface that is currently cold starts to heat up. Okay, and the temperature of the semiconductor material is now going up. And I would like to see how its resistance is going to change. Okay? So I change the set temperature, the temperature is going to slowly go up, it's not going to suddenly change because it's a physical, the physical reality of our life, nothing suddenly changes. So now the temperature is going up. I set, it's about 12 degrees centigrade and the resistance is going down, constantly going down. The temperature is going up, currently the temperature is 19 degrees centigrade and the resistance is going down. Now what's happening inside the semiconductor is that as the temperature goes up, greater amount of thermal generation of carriers is taking place. As a result, there are more charged carriers available to conduct electricity. As a result, the resistance is going down. So if you look at the formula that I've written on the blackboard over here, the current density is proportional to the, um, to the concentration of charge carriers. As the temperature goes up, the concentration of charge carriers goes up. As a result, conduction goes up, or the resistance of the material goes down, or the conductivity goes up. There are different ways of saying the same thing. I increase the temperature even further. Now the temperature is constantly rising, currently it's 29 degrees centigrade, it's going up to 31 and the resistance is constantly, constantly dropping. Okay? Now if I were to repeat the same, the same kind of behavior for, for a resistor, So I'm just going to connect the, just going to disconnect this resistor, this ohmmeter, and I would like to connect the other ohmmeter which is connected to the resistor.
So what I've done now is I've connected the resistor to my to my computer. <laughs> the temperature is currently so let me reduce the temperature again. The temperature is currently 20 degrees centigrade. And let me connect this ohmmeter. Please no talking. So the resistance is about 122 ohms. So I use 120 ohms resistor. Now the change in resistance with temperature is going to be really small for the resistor. And if I were to increase the temperature, let's see what's going to happen. Currently I'm at 16 degrees centigrade. If I were to increase the temperature, <coughs> so the temperature is constantly going up. I'm ramping up the temperature, and the resistance is hardly changing. So the temperature will rise about 30 degrees centigrade and the resistance is hardly changing. If the temperature, so this means that this particular resistor has a small coefficient of resistance, has a small temperature coefficient of resistance. Its resistance doesn't change much by the change of temperature because the temperature is still not large enough to overcome the barrier. The concentration of charge carriers remains roughly the same. If I were to increase the temperature to really large value, say 200 degrees centigrade, 300 degrees centigrade, this resistance is also going to go up. And it's not going to go up because the charge concentration is going to go up. It's going to grow up because the ions start vibrating more vociferously. And when this vibrate more vociferously, more erratically, with bigger amplitudes, they're going to scatter the conduction electrons with a greater probability, and the resistance is going to go up. But this is within the uncertainty limit. This is not uncertainty, right? All right, so let's take a short break, and then we'll proceed in the second half of this class.